the number two internet radio program according to TalkStreamLive.com. This is the Jiggy Jaguar Radio Show. Well, 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 well. Yes, indeed, it is the world famous Jiggy Jaguar Radio Broadcast. It is coast to coast. It is boulder to boulder. It is tune in iTunes Sun Radio Loyalty, as they say. Find us online, JiggyJaguar.com, JiggyJaguar.us. It is the Tuesday edition of our big broadcast. And we are going to go to our next guest. They are going to be joining us on Skype Audio. The Skype on Rooney. Here in a few moments. We're going to talk to Trent Cromarty. He is going to join us here in a few seconds. Hopefully. Hopefully he joins us. There he is, I believe. Hello. Trent Cromarty, how are you, my friend? Doing well, sir. How are you? Pretty good, actually. It's James Lowe from My Heart Radio, giving you a holla holla for your radio interview. We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live. He's the director of Title IX Equality Project at SAVE, which is Stop Abusive and Violent Environments. Trent Cromarty joins us on Skype Audio today here on our big broadcast. And... Um, Are sexual assaults at America's military academies rampant or more of a case of false accusations? Is this like a war on men in the military? Well, today we have got Trent Cromarty joining us on Skype Audio. Um, Tell us a little bit about this. You've got some interesting stats. Give us some details here, my friend. Right. So essentially, our organization works for policy reform to protect all victims, support due process, and stop false allegations. Primarily, right now, we're focusing on Title IX legislative reform. Obviously, we support Title IX uh, because it's against sex discrimination, but right now the system is broken the way it works. So we're working to establish due process rights for all parties involved, whether you're male or female, uh, accused or accuser, it doesn't matter. We just want due process rights and fairness for all. So, I mean, right now... I mean, it takes a quick Google, and you can see there's plenty of lawsuits popping up with these these situations. The National Registry for Exonerations has shown through data that false accusations are an issue. Out there, 2,300 exonerations, around 1,300 of those have had an element of perjury or false accusation. And uh, in 2011, we conducted a survey, a national survey, that found 1 in 10 respondents have been falsely accused of sexual assault, child abuse, or domestic violence. And one-sixth of those respondents knew someone who had been falsely accused. Now, obviously, this, wasn't, this isn't representative of the, the population in general. I think false accusation stats are, diff, like, reliable ones are very difficult to find just because they're incredibly hard to prove, but it's certainly something to consider with this situation. We've got a great guest with us today. He joins us live. Trent Cromarty joins us on Skype Audio to uh, discuss a uh, very interesting situation. He's a military and legal expert. He's the director of the Title IX Equality Project at SAVE, which is Stop Abusive and Violent Environments. And uh, he has got uh, a lot of experience uh, on the ground and in uh, this whole thing. Now, tell us a little bit about your, your experience. July 2011, you were uh, field training near West Point, uh, New York. The class had just returned from a multi-day field training exercise. Uh, so you were all sleep, sleep-deprived, dehydrated, hungry. Uh, g- g- give us some details on, on your experience, my friend. Yes, sir. So... Just, like, just as you said, we were at Camp Buckner training. Uh, we were going into our sophomore year at the academy. And as soon as we got back from the field training exercise, my cadet company commander came out to me and said, Hey, Cromarty, I need you to come down to the man humpy and do a detail. And detail is essentially manual labor. So I got changed, went down to the command humpy, and my company commander said, Hey, we're actually going to the military police station. I asked him why. He didn't, he didn't know why. So we, we, we went there. I was stressed. I was placed in an interrogation room. And after around 15 minutes, an agent came in and informed me that I was being accused of sexual assault by a classmate of mine. And the allegations arose from an alleged incident that had occurred six months prior at a West Point-sponsored ski trip in Canada. The entire encounter was completely consensual, so this kind of took me off guard. It, it kind of came out of nowhere. So I went through a five-hour interrogation in my weekend state. Um, I, you know, I can't help but think the timing of that interrogation was intentional. So after the interrogation, I go through a year and a half or a two year long investigation that culminates in a 
general court martial in which I'm facing essentially life in prison. And so I'm found innocent of all these sexual charges, but they bootstrap me with a false official statement charge for my initial interrogation uh, because I changed it. I went back a day later and changed a single detail. So eventually I go through a misconduct hearing after my court martial and the presiding officer recommends to the superintendent that I be retained at the academy with no further punishment. Unfortunately, the superintendent disregarded that recommendation and kicked me out of the academy going into my senior year. And so that entire situation has kind of motivated, motivated me to pursue my legal degree. I graduated from the University of Denver in May, passed the bar exam in July, and started working with nonprofit organizations. And I ended up landing with SAVE as a director. So that's kind of the entire the entire reason I started this work is to try and provide these process to other individuals in a similar situation and prevent these injustices from occurring. Well, uh, the the thing I'm trying to figure out with with with, with a lot of this, like for instance, you, you said that uh, you had you went back and you changed a single one single detail, and they nailed you with a charge. Uh, give me a little bit more details on this. Right. So essentially, he was questioning me questioning me about a certain sexual incident that had occurred and he was he was a probationary agent so his questioning techniques weren't that effective he was jumping around a lot kind of muddling the details and this is an event that occurred six months prior and you know as i stated we had just got back from the field so i was sleep deprived hungry you know dehydrated and so for five hours i was trying to focus and remember recall these events from some event that almost seemed insignificant to me so after leaving the interrogation, I took time to think about the, the, the statements I made, and I was like, well, I'm not really sure about some of these details. So I went back and reviewed my statement, made a single factual correction to it, and uh, that's where the false official statement charge arose. But it's odd because one of the elements of the false official statement is you have to have an element. The element is a... Uh, and you, like, you're, you, you basically, they're basically saying you wanted to fabricate. You had a motive to fabricate the charge. And if I'm actively correcting my statement, there is no motive to conceal it. So that's essentially where the charge arose. We've got a uh, great guest with us today. He joins us live here on Skype Audio. Trent Cromarty, he is the director of the Title IX Equality Project at SAVE, which is Stop Abusive and Violent Environments. And uh, he went to West Point, he was falsely accused, now he's working to protect others from being falsely accused. And he joins us today here on our big broadcast. Now, uh, tell us about some of the different folks that you've helped and, and uh, you know, been, been able to help them turn around uh, some of their circumstances so they didn't have happen what you had happened to you. Right, well, I can't discuss any specific individuals. Well, yeah, yeah, I meant just kind of an overall, just, just... Right, right. Well, we, I mean, we're active, we're active in legislative reform, so we, we have state monitors, you know, trying to keep an eye out for any negative law that pops up in states regarding these issues, and we're very proactive in that. We've, we've appeared in con- Congress lobbying. We, uh, anytime we have individuals contact an organization, we address their issues and try and help them as best we can, whether that's filing, you know, OCR, OCR complaints or discussing their, their rights with regards to their Title IX procedural issues, things of that nature. Essentially, if someone contacts us or we hear about a case, we'd like to get involved and try and advocate for that individual. That's awesome. That's awesome. We have got a great guest with us today, Trent from Marty, with us here on our big program. And uh, SAVE uh, has, uh, some, has a lot of solutions. You guys... Uh, Basically, go through. You have definitions of uh, offenses need to be specific and require the production of corroborating evidence. Um, complaints, uh, complainants should not be referred to as victims until an accused is adjudicated as committing an offense. Uh, give give us a little bit of details on on some of your uh, what what you guys do with your solutions and everything. Right. Well, we we identified seven major areas of concern. One of those, as you say, was that definitions have become way too broad. Um, for example, affirmative consent, which is the essentially the ongoing obligation by an initiator of sexual activity to gain consent. Regardless of any circumstances, you have to get consent every single time you want to engage in sexual activity. And a lot of schools don't take into account certain circumstances, like whether you're in a long-term relationship or a short-term relationship. 
Um, so they, did, they basically just take that definition at face value, which is dangerous because you have situations arise that you can't account for based on just the definition. For example, Brandeis University had a lawsuit against them because they found a gay man guilty of sexual conduct, conduct, misconduct after he simply kissed his partner on the mouth and that's, that's how they, they came to their ruling of sexual misconduct. The partner who was kissed, you know, after they broke up, became a little disgruntled and filed a complaint against his former partner. And that's what, that's, that's basically where they found that, that guilty verdict. And a federal court judge overruled that and said, you can't, you can't just take the definition, the definition of face value. You have to take other circumstances into consideration. But you're also right with, uh, victims. We shouldn't call victims or excuse me, alleged victims, victims from the outset. Yeah. We can use accuser, complainant, alleged victim, but until there's a finding of guilt, we should not be labeling individual complainants as victims because it really just creates bias. I mean, if you think logically, if you're labeling someone as a victim, there needs to be an offender, and that's the respondent. And even courts are starting to come around to that and, and support that, that stance. In terms of fair and impartial investigations, we need to eliminate the start by believing in trauma-informed approach to investigations. If you're going for like a counselor counseling type stance, trauma-informed is perfectly fine, but if you're placing a trauma-informed stance into an investiga- investigation, all that does is create confirmation bias, and it overlooks in- in- inconsistencies that could generate exculpatory evidence for the accused. We, I think we should also disincentivize complaints. A lot of times schools have things like special academic privileges and the provisions that are provided to the complainants. And so there is an incentive to file complaints with your school. You get special benefits. Um, another huge area of concern is the standard of proof. A lot of schools use preponderance of evidence, which is the lowest standard you have. It's 50.01% chance, I believe, something like that. And that, and for, for the severity of these allegations, you really need a higher standard of proof, like clear and convincing evidence. You know, lives can be ruined by accusations nowadays. It takes one simple word, one simple phrase to change your life. And even if you get out of your investigation on this case legally, you know, you can, you're still going to be suffering mentally. I mean, there's a lot that hinges on these investigations. Um, another area we, w- we would like to see improved is that false accusers be held accountable. We'd really like to see uh, sanctions start being enforced on those who falsely accuse other individuals. I mean, if you if you take a look at the Duke lacrosse case, the individual who accused the lacrosse players, Crystal Mangum, she was essentially let go with no punishment, and years later she ended up murdering her boyfriend. And so if you're a false accuser, it's, it's not wild to assert that if, you're, if you falsely accuse someone once, you're going to do it again. Um, and then I'd, I'd say the last area of concern is that we really need to cut down on sanctions against the accused without, unless there's corroborating evidence. Right now, if an accused individual um, if I gets a complaint filed against him or her, the school can suspend them. They can institute other interim measures that they that, that affects their lives without any without any evidence at all. And that's just way way too way too. Um, extreme for something that has no basis, especially in he said, she, excuse me, he said, she said cases. We've got a great guest with us today. He joins us live. Trent Cromarty is with us from SAVE. And uh, 10% of people have been falsely accused, according to recent studies. And uh, something that I want to get your thoughts on here is what is the effect on the true victims? Uh, whether it's male, female, uh, what what have you, um, the, the the people who are falsely accused and then end up getting adjudicated. Uh, for instance, uh, the Duke lacrosse players, after the conclusion of their investigation, have openly proclaimed that the accuser's false accusation harmed their actual victims more than it harmed them. Uh, give us some details on all this, my friend. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the that's the real tragedy of these situations is that a false accusation completely diminishes the the actual complaints by actual victims. You know, it's ex- essentially stealing their experience and mimicking their actual pain and suffering for their for their own benefit. The only person who benefits out of a false accusation is the false accuser. No one else benefits from it. 
these are already very painful situations, and to add false accusations into the mix just completely muddies the waters. But even in my situation, I think the real tragedy for my my situation is that a lot of people at the academy, you know, they they have, they have this perspective that since she's a false accuser, you know, you really have to be kind of weary about accusations now, and that's truly unfortunate. We need to get to a spot where accusations are taken seriously, but due process rights are maintained for everyone involved. And as I stated, we really want to just address false accusations seriously so that true victims are protected. We've got a great guest with us today. Trent Cromarty joins us. Now, uh, before we let you go, my friend, how do we find you on social media, websites, all that? Right. Well, our organization's website is saveservices.org. Fantastic website with a a great deal of resources. We periodically publish reports that can offer you secondary and tertiary resources, whether you're going through a domestic violence situation, child abuse, or sexual assault situation. You can also feel free to contact us directly. My email is tcromarty at saveservices.org. Um, feel free to shoot me an email if you need it, and I'll, I'll get back to you with, your, with any concerns you have. And uh, I also encourage everyone to get involved with this this situation, contact your representatives, and try to encourage them to address false accusations and Title IX reform in general.